Good evening, folks, and welcome to another Poultry Keepers 360. We are happy to have you here tonight. We've got a good show. I think there's a lot of interest in it, so I, I'm hopeful we'll have some good questions because tonight, coming right up, we're going to be talking about defects and disqualifications. So hang on, and we'll get started in a few seconds. <laughs> Here we are. We're ready to go. Uh, joining me tonight is Jeff Maddox. Karen had a, a slight emergency come up, <laughs> which Jeff and I chuckle. But uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, hopefully she'll be able to join us later on tonight. We don't know. Just depends on how things turn out. Um, in talking about Defects and disqualification. Oh, before I forget, and I told Jeff I was going to do that. He, he'll whip me. Uh, we wanted to remind folks that in our Facebook groups, we occasionally uh, miss comments or miss posts. And if it's something you want us, Jeff or I, to comment on, just tag us in that post so we'll make sure that we see it because we don't always see them. So just keep that in mind. And, and also, uh, if you send us a friend request on our personal pages and we don't, don't accept you, it's because, you know, we, not because we don't love you, but, uh, our personal pages is for our personal stuff. And we try to keep our, our poultry stuff, uh, relegated to the appropriate groups. So with that started, Jeff, why don't we talk about, uh, defects and disqualification, but, uh, when we start out, Defects and disqualifications. What is a defect? Well, the standard defines that as anything short of perfection. So <laughs> defects can really be about anything, but there's some general uh, defects, over, and we'll talk about the difference between those uh, coming up here in a little bit. Uh, so then the next question, obviously, is what is a disqualification? And again, here's the standard definition. It's a deformity or defect sufficiently serious enough to depar, excuse me, debar a fowl from an award. And these are usually inherited. So there is a genetic basis for just about all those uh, disqualifications. And that's the reason you want to work so diligently, diligently in getting them out of your flock. Now, th there are some um, general defects and disqualifications that apply to all breeds while there are some that are very breed specific. Now we don't have time tonight to go over all the breed specific uh, disqualifications and defects. I just want to encourage you to be sure that you uh, read your breeds written description in the standard because that's where you're going to find those breed specific issues. So bear that in mind, please, 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 please. Uh, I often get asked, are some defects worse than others? And how, how can I tell the difference? The best way I can tell you to do that there, and there are some that I think are worse than others. But if you'll go to the standard of perfection and there's a, those first 39 pages or so, there's a section called cutting for defects. And that will help you decide. In other words, how many points should a judge deduct from your bird score? Now, a bird can score overall 100 points. So some defects may be one or two point cut. Some of them may be a half a point cut. You can then use those to cross-reference with the uh, standard perfection uh, scale of points to find out, for example, looking at a bird's head, what's, where are most of the points allocated? And that will help you a lot when you start uh, selecting birds or, or, or really culling through your birds and, and finding the word, the birds to keep. And I, I'm, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I see an awful lot uh, of folks who have single cone breeds uh, that, um, a breed, for example, that should have five points on the comb, 
and they really stress when their birds are coming up with six points or seven points on their comb. When there's probably things about your bird that require more attention than how many points on the comb. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I have seen a really excellent bird of good type and good color with a six or seven point comb win over a bird that was slightly lesser in quality that had five points on their comb. For every point more or less than five points, a judge has to deduct a half a point. Now, in the scheme of a thing, the scheme of things in a hundred hundred point scale, a half a point, that's not very much. So that tells me that I don't need to stress really over how many points on a bird's comb. You know, unless we start getting up into the eight, nine, or ten uh, points on a ten point comb, I don't really worry about it. But just it, it's a case really of having to to pick your battles. What works for you? You know, let's take a look at some of the common uh, defects and disqualifications, and you're probably going to have to enlarge it so you can see, particularly the photo on the left. That's an image of a duck foot, what is defined as a duck foot. And a duck foot is when the prop toe or the rear toe curls forward to be in line with the front toes. Why, why is that important, you know? Well, as the name implies, prop toe. You know, that's what helps the bird prop itself up. Sometimes I, I watch birds, and if, if they look like they're having a funny gait, I'll pick them up and I'll check them to see if they have duck foot. And it's not too uncommon when you see that, that they do have duck foot. And that's something that you really don't want to get established in your flock. Now, bear in mind that so many, I mean, so many of the defects and disqualifications are recessive traits. So when you have two birds with a recessive trait come together and those two recessive genes align, then it expresses itself in, uh, in the young birds. Uh, over, over on the right, is a case of a crooked keel. And it's funny because uh, so many defects and disqualifications were brought about because, let's face it, at one point, standard bred poultry was the production poultry of the time. So anything that marred the appearance of a carcass was severely cut against. Now, in chickens, do you think it's a defect or disqualification? Jeff, would you like to take a guess on that? <clears throat> I would say defect, not necessarily a disqualification. Correct. Now, $64,000 question, what about in turkeys? I have no idea. You haven't taught me about turkeys yet, Rip. <laughs> in turkeys, it is a disqualification why it is in one breed and not in the other one, I really can't answer that question because I wasn't around when the standard was first written. And uh, some of the things that are in the standard up today, I, I just sit and scratch my head over and thought, you know, that's okay, but it doesn't really make as much sense as I think it should sometimes. Well, there's no continuity just because you go from, you know, a chicken you know, even if you went over to waterfowl or turkey, why would you make a different, you know, why would you set a different difference in that disqualification? So to me, it should be all or none, right? It, oh, I agree. It should be one way or the other. But, um, but I'm guessing that the turkey standard probably came out later than the chicken one. Or, you know, it was slightly later. Right. And we are getting a bunch of good questions, so you know um, that's good. If if you see any, if you see any good questions or comments, flip we will flip them up there and, and we'll dive into them. There you go. All right. 
Rob was uh, waiting for the show to start. So he was Johnny on the spot today, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. He wants to know the distinction between defects that are cosmetic versus functional and a little bit of talk about things that are defects and disqualifications in one bird, one breed versus a desired trait in a other breed if if that makes sense it does make sense and okay. and rob I, I appreciate your comment um like we kind of touched on most of the disqualifications are there because they have a functional application it's not just an outward cosmetic thing many of the defects are more cosmetic in nature you know uh, the number of points on a comb that that's more of a cosmetic thing uh, crooked keels and turkeys that that's obviously very much a, a carcass related issue and something to be really concerned about as far as uh, defects and disqualifications in one breed versus being a desired trait in another one thing that comes to mind right off the top of my head is that uh, there is a breed out there called sultans s-u-l-t-a-n-s and In regular poultry, uh, a, con a condition called vulture hawks, and I don't think I have a picture of it here uh, because it's getting to be pretty uncommon, but vulture hawks is when there's uh, hard feathers extending past uh, the lower part of the thigh. But in sultans, it's a breed requirement that they have this disqualification. Uh, that's not the only other disqualification there. They've got several others in that breed too, but I thought that was an example. Now over in Europe, the preference there is for Brahmas to have vulture hawks. Where here in America, in America, that's a big no, no. Uh, so some of, and I, I know we've got European uh, folks who, who listen in and, um, I, I know I see some pictures that our friend from Burma used to post about the Brahmas they had over there. And I'm sitting there thinking, holy cow, look at the vulture hawks on that bird. But that's perfectly normal for over in that area. Here's some um, comb defects um, that are fairly common, but not terribly common. Um, the picture on the top left, that dark smudge looking spot is called a thumb mark or thumb print. And when you see it on a bird, it's hard to draw it and make it look like it, but it's like you took your thumb and just pressed in and left an indentation on that comb. This is a case of where it's kind of cosmetic, uh, but, um, in some breeds, you, you you need to have a male with that defect in the breeding pen. Uh, breeds that have lopped comb in females, uh, leggards, for example. I see some some strains of leggards that have nearly straight comb, and that's because they're not using males with the thumbprint on it to cause that comb to lop. So thumbprints can be a detriment to you, or, or it, it can be a requirement. You don't want to show a bird with it, but it's definitely usable in the breeding pen under the right situation. Um, lop single combs. Uh, this is another interesting one. Uh, in cockerels, a comb that is lopped over to one side is not a disqualification. But in cockbirds, it is a disqualification when the comb lops over and extends below the horizontal plane of the eye because it actually inhibits or, or causes blindness on that one side. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> did, did I hear you right? So for a cockerel or an immature cock, mm -hmm. it's it's okay. Yes. But for a mature bird, it's not. And Correct. It seems vice versa because a younger bird should not have a problem, you know, with a lopped comb. And you would think as it matures and that comb gets larger that it would be more likely to lop over. But don't they have that backward drip? Sorry, I, I'm learning. No, here. no, 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 no. Yeah. I'm kind of on your side a little bit uh, because now I know in cockerels, some young cockerels, 
if they are raised in a dark area, if they don't have access to, to the proper amount of sunlight, you'll see their combs on single comb birds start to lop over. Okay. But once you get them outside or once they can get exposure to sunlight, those combs just come right on up. Okay. Didn't know that. See, uh, so I hang around with you old folks, so I get to learn stuff. <laughs> hey, I'm not that much older than you now. Come on, cut me a break. So Michelle has a couple questions, and I think I'm going to throw them in here now. Okay. Um, so, you know, she's not sure if you're going to cover this type of defect or not, or focus on structural things, but she wants to know in laced varieties, which is more serious defect, mossiness or frosting? Um, and, and folks, if you don't know what mossiness is, that's on laced or pencil varieties. Uh, the background should ideally be a clean color, but mossiness uh, will usually show as fine stipplings of um, a black color. For example, in uh, I think Michelle works with with uh, Barna builders, if I remember correctly, and they have they're on a gold background, so you've got this kind of dark reddish brown ground color to the feather that has these distinct bands of lacing going around but then you throw in that effect of mossiness or that stippling of black within that and it, it just immediately makes that bird much darker than it actually is now <clears throat> frosting is when you look at a feather under the right light conditions uh, and the very outer edge of the feather shows a distinctly lighter color than the lacing of that feather uh, or, or the stippling of that feather. I, I know some lines of uh, black-breasted red, old English game bantams used to be horrible uh, with frosting. They've pretty much got most of it cleaned up now. Um, so which yeah. one's more serious, Rip? I mean, as a judge, you know, are they both equally? They're both equally. Okay. I, I think, and, and from a breeding standpoint, they should be equally weighted. Okay. Because they both have an impact uh, in one way or the other on the way that bird appears. So. All right. Michelle, so neither. So one is not more serious than the other. No. Okay. I would give those equal weight. Right. She hasn't started calling for it yet, but she it's, you know, she wants to know where to prioritize and she had a second part to that. So, and I don't have the answer if, if frosting or stippling is nutritional or is it purely genetic? I don't know that I can affect that as a nutritionist, but Michelle, I tend to think that it's genetic because going back to my old English, example <clears throat> i was seeing it not just in one localized area like in the southeast but i would find it in birds uh, in the midwest and birds out in the uh, pacific states uh, i think uh, if it would have been a nutritional basis that it wouldn't have been such a widespread issue the I, only thing that the only thing that i would say to that rip is that um you know, with all the common feeds like the neutrinas, the purinas, the, you know, and all those that you can pretty much get anywhere in the country, it still could have a tie in nutritionally. But I'm not saying that that is for sure. No, okay. I, I understand. I, I don't, but, you know, with the commonality of many of the major brands of feed now that you can get in multiple locations. Yes. Um, I'm not going to say that it's not nutritional, but I have nothing to tie it to. I know that, you know, the feather quality itself, you know, the veins and so on are definitely tied to proper nutrition. Absolutely. But, but color or color variances, I'm, I'm 90% sure is really genetic, right? I, I would think so, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I, I talked about the birds out in the Pacific Northwest. 
it seems that those breeders out there are much more attuned to using a good high quality feed than the folks here in the southeastern u.s i'm not, I'm not saying that's always the case but just in talking to them I've, I've discovered a lot more of those folks were using a really good high quality feed well and i think it's availability too you know as i travel oh, yeah. in, when i travel in the southeast um you know some of the first comments i hear are people talking about the cost of their feed and they're looking you know to save a couple bucks a bag that sort of thing um and i think cost consciousness is greater in the southeastern region than it would be in the pacific northwest um just, i would agree with that just kind of what i see um as i travel around but yeah I, to me i don't think it's nutritional i think it's more genetic um and uh, from what i'm what i've heard from other breeders and experts is it's not necessarily easy to get rid of and it can creep in on you you know generations down the road so yeah you may actually want to start doing some harder calling early on if you can if you have enough birds to do it um, start working it out i'm going to touch on that a little bit yeah. later on in this in this presentation um the bird in the upper right has a hollow center that's a rose cone breed and you can also look at it they didn't mention it here but it's also lopped over to one side which is another uh, another no-no uh, the bird down on the bottom left it's very hard to see but he has a side sprig and i see that a lot in single cone birds uh, if you look to the rear of the last spike on the blade of the comb you see that little b-shaped area that's actually a protuberance of a, a fleshy projection there uh, and they may be in other areas of the comb but usually they're on that end of the comb or or up somewhere towards the, the rear of the comb up high on the comb but they can occur in in other places our, our next slide is it speaks to unevenness of the serrations on a comb. Uh, you can see this bird's comb is unevenly serrated. It has one double point on it. Uh, that's a cosmetic thing, but uh, you know that's here again. That's something to to select against for. And number six is an example of a twisted comb, where it looks like you. You grabbed hold of the front or sometimes the rear and just gave it a really good hard twist and it stayed in place. So it's a defect though, right? Yes. So the comb, the comb for the most part is when you're judging the comb, there's not really a disqualification there, right? Because there it, is. It, so what would be, what would be disqualification on a comb? Funny you should ask that. <laughs> On this little buff wind up pullet, right there at the red arrow, you can see it looks like they took the point of the comb and just shoved it back into the base. And that's called an inverted inverted spike. And that's a disqualification. And once you get inverted spikes established in a line of rose cone breeds, it can be the dickens to breed that out of them. Yeah, but do you really go get outside blood or do you just, no, you know, you can do it without going to outside blood, right? Unless it's so badly entrenched. But I've I've worked with a good number of different varieties of wine dots, and and they would have it on occasion. Uh, but I was able to to get past it without having to go for outside blood. Because I just know that some of the breeding experts out there really shy away from bringing in new blood. Yes, you know, and you're I'm more better like, to okay. Yeah, you're better to purify from within versus going out and buying somebody else's problems. Yes. Because you're starting over, you know, when you bring in new genetics, even though it's the same breed. Um, and unless you know the person and what they've been keeping, you know, if it's not the same line, like if you, if you gave or sold birds to somebody and they kept your line for a long period of time, you could go back to them. Let's say you had an accident and you needed a, a, oh, a yeah. breeding cock or something, right? You, you could go back to that, 
and you're that's not, the way to do it. Right. You know, but you hear a lot of people, they're not satisfied with what they got and they go buy somebody else's genetics. And I, I think it, I think it puts them backwards myself, but anyway, sorry, I'm, we're, no, we're digressing. Okay. And, but yeah. Jeff, you're absolutely right. Because if I've got a line, my line of Rhode Island reds and I ran into a problem where I felt like I needed to bring in outside blood and I went to somebody that has a totally unrelated line. All I'm doing is when I cross those lines is I'm mixing all the bad qualities unintentionally, all the bad qualities from my line with all the bad qualities from that other line. And you wind up with it. It never works out the way folks thinks it would. It seems like it puts you two steps back instead of one step forward to two or um, three giant steps backwards. Yeah. Yeah. You just don't know what you're going to get, but anyway, but what you were talking about, um, wise breeders that I have known maintained satellite flux of their own line of birds, where they would set folks up, uh, and get them started in that breed or that variety. So if they ran into a problem, they knew who they could go to to get related birds, but not closely related birds to bring in and help resolve the problem. Right. Yeah. But you have to be willing to trust those people. When you set up those satellite flocks, oh, you have yeah. to be willing to trust that they're not going to bring in new blood to try and, you know, better the line. But, uh, this was a really good comment. I, I don't know who put it. It's in there as game foul poultry health hub, mm -hmm. but he judges game foul. Um, and he believes that the genetic defects are the, are the most important ones. I agree. And yeah. So do I. So. And sometimes they can be the hardest to get rid of too. <laughs> oh, the, the photo on the right, uh, is an example of curly toes or curled toes. So what, where does that come from? Um, I mean, I know where it comes from when they're immature, mm -hmm. but I, you know, at, later in, in age, I start worrying about things like Marix that causes this, you know, some sort of nerve damage. The other thing that I worry about is birds that are kept on wire too long, right? Uh, you know, in elevated cages, their life is spent on wire. I tend to see a little bit more curly toe there, mm -hmm. but the only two things that I know, and you know, from where I come from is, you know, Marix will cause curly toe and, um, and then wire, but I don't know. I think there's also a, a nutritional basis. And I've, I've read some papers about that. That it, it is his chicks. So riboflavin is huge. Yes. Right. If, if so. the parents have a deficient or diet deficient in riboflavin, it will begin to show up in baby chicks hatching early coral toes. Yeah, and you'll see it to between day seven and day 10 and, and whether the hen was deficient, you know, or the feed that they're feeding is deficient and riboflavin being one of the B vitamins that is less stable. So this is where that old feed, I keep preaching it, you know, it's oh, yeah. riboflavin is one of the first ones to deplete and, and disappear. So, um, that's why for chicks, it's really important question for you, Jeff. Yeah. Those, uh, water soluble B vitamins you refer to, would that help with curl toes? Um, I'd have to read the label. I am not sure that riboflavin's in there. I, I have treated it with that water soluble in the past. Um, and I think there's one of the other B vitamins that's mimicking or the bird is utilizing it in place of riboflavin because mm -hmm. I have seen improvement. I've seen it help, but, um, yeah, riboflavin, you know, uh, true riboflavin. Some people actually just go to the store and get uh, baker's yeast, you know, yeast for like yep. making bread yep. and you can use that. That tends to be pretty high in riboflavin as well. So, that's a I couple know, of quick fix options. I, I know the, the game bantam folks here in the Southeast are big believers in, in using uh, baker's yeast as a supplement yeah. to their feed. 
Right. I, I mean, I wish they wouldn't have to do that. You know, there's brewer's yeast and baker's yeast. Both yeah. of them are really good in B vitamins. Um, you know, uh, me as a nutritionist, I'm hoping that it's already in your feed in ample amounts. But, you know, to be honest, the B vitamins are really expensive. So nobody's putting extra in. Just just know that. Right? That's... But Rob had a follow-up question or comment. Not all strains end up having the same genetics that you need. In theory, you know, the bird you introduce could be better strain, but... Uh, strained arrays, but you might have, you know, you may might have everything but that trait, admittedly. There are recessives. So he's just reiterating what we no. were talking about earlier no. about bringing in new blood. And, so. and let's talk about what I think is a good way to bring in new blood. Most people, when they bring in new blood, will go to somebody and they'll get a male but I prefer to use a female and I, I encourage folks to use a female rather than a male. And the reason is if you bring in a new male and you've got 10, 15, 20 females, the chances of you breeding him to a large number, if not all of those females is really, really great. Well, if it works, that's fine. But if it's a flop and causes you a problem, it's a huge mess to try to clean up. But if you'll bring in a female and breed her to a male, you know, use the practices of compensation mating uh, where she's weak. You want a male, a male that compensates by that, by being strong um, and slowly introduce that new blood. That will give you an idea how it's going to work with your flock. Now, in compensation mating, there's something I, I really want to make sure is because there are some folks that kind of tend to go to the extreme in their compensation matings because they think compensation matings means you have a, a bird with a, a weakness, okay, that's substandard, so to speak. Well, they go to the extreme other end of the spectrum and breed that bird to a bird that is really extreme in that, that quality. And that really never works out because what most folks find is they get birds or chicks that are extreme negatively or extreme positively. And they, they never come together uh, in that middle point. So you want to breed a bird that is a, deficient in an area to a bird that has a meets the standard in that same area. I don't so know if that makes sense. It, it does rip. And I just, I, I, I want to come at this from a different angle. So sure. <clears throat> many notable breeders, you know, that I've been able to spend time with and have conversations. I hear tell you're way better off to buy the high quality hen that you're looking for my understanding or the number that I've heard quoted is the hen carries 80% of the genetics for the offspring or the progeny. So you're actually the fastest way for you to make a change forward is with the hen. If that's a true number. Now, I, I don't know what number you've heard, but <clears throat> everybody gets all excited about looking at the rooster because you know, he's bigger and his plumages and all that. But right. That my understanding is the hen carries the majority of the genetics, right? He I, has, I don't know what the proportions are. Right. That'd uh, be interesting to know. I, I've heard a number from a couple of people, you know, 80%. The hen carries 80% of the genetics. And that means the rooster or the cock only has, you know, 20% influence on on the outcome. So, so if you're going to do the hen thing, you know, you might seriously want to, you know, after you raise that clutch up and you start doing some selection, you may actually want to do some, some inbreeding or line breeding, you know, uh, if you can get a good cock roll. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. So, I mean, if you're going to bring in new blood, you need to maximize what you're doing there because you're trying to get rid of negative traits or defects or something. Right. So you might as well hone in on that 
then you're creating a brand new line within your breed you're creating right. your own brand new line so right. sorry i mean we're getting way off here no no I, but, all of this is important well i i think it's really good but we're just you know i don't want to people want to hear about the defects too uh sue wanted to know if you could talk about beard genetics um well like i said i'm no geneticist and it's been several decades since i've worked with a a bearded breed uh, i believe that there are more than one genes involved in genetics um i want to say i remember reading there was maybe three um uh, with with one gene you get a very minute beard with two copies of the gene you get a little bit larger beard and with three copies of that gene you you get a really large beard on the birds so sue i'm sorry i'm not being a whole lot of help to you uh, i have talked to folks that have encountered beardless a, a small percentage of beardless uh chicks that hatch uh, but you, you need to find a good poultry geneticist to talk to and i'm i'm not that person <laughs> yeah but i mean i don't know that there's anybody out there anymore you, when you start talking poultry geneticist right they're they want to talk about you know a red sex link they want to yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. you know cornish cross they want to you know and uh there's not a lot of them out there anyway and you can't understand anything that they say if you did get one in a room alone so uh, I don't disagree with you, Rip. I just don't know where Sue's going to find that person. Sue, so, um, I reach out to Matt Lamone. He's a, he's a uh, judge up in Ohio. Matt's working with uh, crested breeds. Uh, that would be who I would send you to to ask that question. Uh, the other thing, uh, and we were talking about, Jeff, we were talking about uh, a good poultry geneticist. The last one that I knew was Fred Jeffries and he passed away and he's really the only genetics guru uh, trained poultry geneticist that could breed really good birds to the standard. And I, he wrote a, a book called, uh, oh, what was the title of that book? Ban I think it was Bantam Chickens by Fred Jeffries. But he talks a lot about genetics. In that and maybe way. there's something in there. It's just the geneticists that I run into, they have no focus on the types of birds that we're talking about tonight. No. Right? No. Now, there might be some in Europe because they are doing a lot more throwback chicken or um, like the LaBelle Rouge or they're, they're trying to get that um, heritage bird back on the plates in restaurants and, you know, uh, give some competition to Cornish cross and regular meat production, but I, I wouldn't know where to find them. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Sigrid van Dort, I, I think from the Netherlands. Carol just uh, said that Grant, uh, Grant Barrington from, yes. from the UK is really good. If we He's can find one her. I was going to recommend, yeah. but outside of those two, I, I wouldn't know where to send folks. Yeah. I don't, I don't either. I haven't ran into one. All they want to talk about is production birds because yep. that's where the money's at. Right? Sure. So you're going to find somebody with a passion. You, you can't blame them for that. I, Jeff, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it. And you're probably going to cringe when I say this, but that's just like poultry nutritionist. You are a rarity <laughs> in the poultry nutrition field because you are willing to and do work with the small flock owner. The big guys, they don't, they they don't have an interest. Yeah. Rob's agreeing that, you know, all the money for science is coming from, you know, the money side or the commercial side. So he's absolutely right. Yep. Look, and I swore when I started back into this, <clears throat> I am not doing anything on a commercial scale because I am not fighting for the last nickel, right? Yeah. It ain't going to happen. If I got to do that, I'll go pump gas or flip burgers at McDonald's or something. I, I think not I can get it. more. Yeah. So, um, not worth it. This is fun, right? And when it quits being fun, I'm just going to quit. So, to do something else, my friend. That's right. Yeah. All right. We're caught up on questions. All um, right. Here yep, we go. Can, yep. 
Uh, here's another couple of defects and disqualifications. Slipped wing, and, and this on the bird on the left has a slipped wing and also has a twisted feather. You can see down there on the bottom, indicated by the red arrow. Slipped wing is is one when you view a bird from the side, uh, the wing just appears loose, like it's hanging part way down. Now that's opposed to a, a split wing over on the right hand side, where there's a an actual physical gap between the primaries and secondary feathers. But if you're if you're wondering whether your bird has slipped wing or split wing, just pick them up, grab a wing, and kind of fan it out, and you'll be able to see. Usually, split wings do not have an axial feather. That's that little short feather that separates the primaries from the secondaries. And once you have it extended, just turn it loose real quickly and let it uh, the, the wing fold up by itself. If it folds up and then drops back down, that's a pretty good indication you've got a slipped wing. So is that twisted feather genetic or is yes. that twisted feather nutritional? Because I could, I, I could make an argument that that could be nutritional, but. I, I believe that it can be both. Okay. I, I think what they were going after when they wrote the standard was the genetic side of the coin because, and this may be a, a wrong assumption on my part. Uh, back in that day, there wasn't a good understanding of poultry nutrition like we have today. Yeah, there was a lot of guessing going on, but I tell you what, there's still a lot of guessing going on today, Rip. So, you know, there's well, just, yeah. there's nothing out there for the types of, that I can't find any good data for the types of birds that we're raising today, right? So we're, we're, we're basically rewriting the book by trial and error, folks, right? And that's just the truth of it. There's, there's nothing, there's no foundational information on how to feed or, you know, the nutritional requirements for show type poultry. Uh, very often I'll tell people, and this is something we talked about in our podcast today, that I'm pretty well convinced that heritage breeds or, or really standard bred poultry do better when managed, not necessarily fed, but managed much like they were doing it in the thirties and forties. That modern management is so been so adapted and so fine tuned into working with uh, production birds that you know it just doesn't transfer from a production bird to a standard bred bird. Well, the purpose the purpose of the birds is completely different. So on okay. one side, you know, I'm trying to get the most number of eggs out of a hen, or I'm trying to get you know a broiler to grow as fast as possible, right? for the better return on investment. That's not what we're trying to do over on the breeder side or the show side at all. That's not, I mean, yes, we want a few more eggs. You know, Karen's been breeding to get more eggs out of her Rhode Island reds. That's been one of her traits, but, <clears throat> and, and get them back to being that true dual purpose where you can get 180 to 200 eggs out of a hen or a little bit more. But that's, you know, that's not our sole focus is you know that's it's not about making money um, no. but <clears throat> well if there's any small flock keepers out there that are doing this to make money and they're doing it i want to know what your secret is <laughs> <laughs> because i could never do it you never um, make money on a hobby come on rip um, nah, so I mean, laura laura tried to share a link um for beard genetics and but it didn't come through for some reason. I didn't, I didn't see it. And I didn't see it either. Laura, yeah, if you would post know. that over on the poultry keepers, three sixty group. Yeah. And, and we'll pick it up and share it from there. Cause we need it, right? We need it yeah. out there. Yes, yeah, we do. Um, I don't know why the link didn't come through in the comments. Um, I have no idea. I would have shared it. Sometimes stream yard is really good. And sometimes it makes me scratch my head. So Rob's uh, saying that some defects are both genetic and nutritional. And I agree. And yeah. I don't, Rob, you know, we're learning. I don't know where the line is. Right. I mean, 
you know, I, I know what this vitamin does and I know what this, these amino acids do and I know what the different proteins are doing for a bird or I think I do, you know, and I'm still learning that part too, but, um, I agree. You know, when I started working with breeders, I thought, you know, I could take somebody's junk birds and turn them into something miraculous. And I still don't disbelieve that, but I stay, I think there's a lot of genetics behind it as well. I think I'd have a lot of work to get it all cleaned up, but yeah. I, I agree with you, Rob. And, and folks, you know, we we're talking a good bit about nutritional aspects of feeding poultry, but you need to go out and buy I'm, Jeff's going to cringe again. You need to go out and buy a copy of Jeff's book, Niche <laughs> Poultry, Nutrition and Management. It It is the only publication I have ever come across that really provides and is trying to provide help to the small uh, flock keeper and those working with standard bred poultry or heritage breeds, whatever you want to call them. That, you know, John Gunnerman and I were talking about that today. Uh, it's one of those books that you just want to stick in your hip pocket and carry with you everywhere you go. Uh, it's that good. Well, when I put it together, it was that size fits in most jean pockets. Mm -hmm. So you can take it to the barn or the field or wherever you're going. Right. And it, 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 look, it's a reference guide. It's not made for entertainment. If you want to sit there in the evening and read it, it'll put you to sleep. It's better than anything I know to put you to sleep. But, um, you know, it, it was fully intended as a reference guide for different topics, different, you know, so. And it is an excellent <laughs> reference guide. You know, it, it ought to be in everybody's poultry library. You can order it from furtrail.com. I'm, I'm done with the commercials tonight, Jeff. Thanks, Rip. Thanks, you Rip. No, you're not. You'll do another one. I know you will. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Here's uh, an example of a couple of defective tails squirrel tail and the squirrel tail is when the tail is carried forward of 90 degrees towards the head. Uh, right tails is when the tail flops over to one side or the other. Now you can check for right tails because sometimes a bird, if they got a lazy tail or, or a, he just wants to mess with you, I think, but he'll seem to carry his tail to one side for a little while and then flip it over and carry it on the other side. But if you'll take that bird and hold it, hold the body in your hands with your hands around the wing because you don't want to get flapped at, but just tilt him forward towards your body real quick and back. And what will happen, he'll bring that tail up, and if it's a right tail, it will fall to one side or the other. And a right tail is called, caused by a skeletal uh, problem. It's, it, it's actually a deformity within the skeleton. And some folks also have a problem with learning how to measure uh, tail angle. And here's a really good picture. Um, but it talks, and you want to measure it from the horizontal plane. In other words, the horizontal part of the back. Just like sticking a protractor on there. This bird has about a 40, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a 45 degree tail angle is what's required on uh, Old English. So, you know, just imagine a protractor behind your bird. So you're looking for 45 degree? On, on that particular breed. Okay. Uh, so when you were talking about not necessarily, ride tail regardless of breed is pretty much a bad thing. Yes. Right? And that's a disqualification? Yes. Okay. But squirrel tail. That's also I, a disqualification. I, Right, but I've seen birds, like certain breeds, where it seems like they, I mean, they want right at 90, you know, for the look of that bird, right? Um, am I wrong? I, I uh, thought I've no, seen certain. No, I, and okay. there's some of them that really push that envelope, even if they don't have a 90 degree or a really high tail cage. Um, some, some of them do require uh, yeah. a, a squirrel tail. Uh, Japanese bantams, Saramas are ones. I was going to say, I, all the Sarama pictures I see, yeah. it looks like they're forward of that 90 degree mark. Oh, yeah. And, but then when you get to something like an ASIL, for instance, it's completely opposite. You're never going to get a 45 degree angle on an ASIL, no. right? Uh, well, like Rhode Island Ridge, males yeah. should have a 20 degree tail angle. 
Okay. Females, you drop it 10 right. degrees and they should have a 10 degree table gauge. All right. So it, it does it. So that standard varies breed to breed based on. Yes. Yes. Okay. Got it. I'm just, thanks for the clarification. Not a problem. <clears throat> okay. Um, some defects can be spotted when chicks are hatched, uh, cross beak or scissors beak. Uh, in some instances, uh, if it's, and, and I think this is an incubator, uh, problem. You see, Chicks hatching with curled toes. I, I honestly believe that's more uh, an incubation problem. And I, I'm kind of like Jeff, the true curl toe doesn't show up for a few days. Uh, the riboflavin deficiency won't show up usually till about day seven. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So just soon after the yolk. Now at hatch, if the hen didn't have an ample amount of riboflavin to deposit into the yolk, it could be part of that at hatch or, you know, that first couple days, but I don't know. So while some, some things you can see when the chicks are hatched, like if you got good eyes, which mine are not anymore, uh, but you can, uh, single comb birds, you can actually, uh, count the points on a comb at that point. Not that it makes a hill of beans worth of difference one way or the other. But I'm just saying that there's some things that will show up earlier than others, um, and particularly color flaws. They may not show up until uh, you're getting uh, mature feathers almost completely molted in. I, I used to tell, I still do tell folks, that if you're breeding Rhode Island Reds, I don't even think about culling for color until those birds have all their primary adult primaries in. Um, and and depending on the line you're working with, that can be six months of age on up. So uh, it, it really requires paying constant attention to your birds, handling them and, and culling through them on a regular basis to get, to get it all. Uh, elimination of defects and disqualifications, like I said, requires constant, vigilant, and strict culling practices. What a lot of folks don't realize, if they have a bird that crops up that has a defect that they don't want, they'll cull that bird. But it doesn't remove it, the genetics from the flock. To really be able to do that, you need to cull that bird and the birds that produced it. Because they both have those recessive traits that caused it to pop up in the chicks. Yeah, uh, Rob makes an excellent point here. That, uh, he used to have a few breeds, and if the incubator was too cool, only the, the uh, Osteroids would hatch with curly toes. Right. Uh, it goes back to what I say time and time again, you know. It depends on the breeds you're working with as much as anything else, I think, sometimes. <clears throat> on this slide, you know, I did want to say uh, all the best breeders that I know um, uh, are pretty ruthless. I mean, they call hard. Yes. And most people would think that they don't have compassion for life. But if you're going to be a serious breeder, you have to be able to make those tough decisions and call hard. You can't, you really can't feed them for two years, hoping that they're going to fix themselves. Right. So. You, right. You, you have in breeding, you have to take the long view and yeah. what is the best for the breed overall. You know, if you're going to improve it, you'll never do it. Keeping and breeding mediocre birds. Just not going to happen. So, folks, that concludes my report for the night. Um, I don't know, Jeff, do we have any other? Uh, no, no I, I've been popping them in there as they've oh, been. Good man. Um, good man. And, man, I, I thought you had a lot more to go, and I was worried you were going to get back <laughs> at the time or something, Rip, or miss supper or anything. No, so no, no. You no. did good. Well, we're right there. I, I knew that we had a lot of interest, and I had seen a lot of interest yeah. uh, over on the Facebook groups, and, and so I was pretty sure yeah. we were going to have it um, a, a good number of questions, and we had some really questions. I think some of the best questions – we have had in a very long time. I agree. This is some of the best interaction we've had. We've had really good viewership tonight. And I mean, if anybody's got, you know, we got five minutes left folks. So if you got any more questions for rip, 
you know, he's on the firing line. Let him have it. So <laughs> you're all hard. <laughs> I threw you right out there. You know, I, I, did, I well, threw you to the that, wolves. So turned about it's only fair play. I, I, know. I know I did some things you weren't fond of. That's all right. I, I, before we go, there's a couple of things I do want to bring up. One is our poultry keepers podcast. Now these are audio podcasts. Uh, we started doing, we're about, I think we've got seven episodes published currently, uh, but they upload or they go public every Tuesday morning at 4 a.m. for you early morning risers uh, like Jeff and, and Karen, uh, in case you're just absolutely bored to tears, let's give that podcast a listen. Uh, Madeline Royal officially debuted today as a new co-host with us, and she brings an awful lot to the program. And I'm just tickled to death that she agreed to come on with John Gunnerman and I as another co-host. She brings so much to that program. Um, next Tuesday uh, on the podcast, we'll start a multi-part series, or I shouldn't say multi-part, multi-episode series on what we think about getting started, excuse me, getting started, uh, breeding, uh, continual improvement of your birds, educational resources, uh, Jeff, I'm going to do it again, but we, we mentioned your book in that. So, <laughs> and you can listen to the podcast on Buzzsprout or we're also on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google podcast, and others too. So check your favorite podcast platform. You can probably find us there. My rip, I threw you under the bus. So we have three more, we have three more comments slash questions. So, oh, that's cool. Yeah. <clears throat> so Carol wants to know, you know, do you think uh, she wants to know more about the mossiness? If you don't call them as chicks, do you think that uh, you will just get more mossiness? Carol, here's my thoughts on not only mossiness, but any other defect or disqualification. I call it when I see it. If I see it in chicks, I'll call it then. If I see it in grow outs, then I'll call it then. Or if I have to wait to see it until they're adults, I'll call it then. Just that. Really you know it. You know it's in there, right? Yeah. It's in yeah. there at some stage. So waiting for it to disappear, you, you're just kicking the can down the road, right? I mean, you're yeah, not. Okay. Exactly right. Right. And she goes, you know, or wait till they grow out adult plumage. Um, and I think you answered it, you know, if they don't, but yeah, if, if you know that bird has a defect, even if it's not showing, I, that would, to me, at least disqualify that bird immediately as a breeder. And Shannon wants to know how many generations back should you call for a defect or disqualification? Shannon, that's a tough question to answer. Uh, because not everybody has had their birds for the same length of time. Uh, and I, I'm thinking Shannon is um, uh, referring to when I said remove the birds that have the, the problem plus the birds that produced it. Uh, and, you know, some of you keep reasonably good, or I shouldn't say reasonably good, but really good pedigree records. Um, so, you know, you could theoretically go back in time and remove some of those birds and the birds they produced. But, I, you know, just start where you are if you see a problem. And if it's something that's a little more serious to you, remove that bird from the flock and remove the parents of that bird. Just my 25 cents worth of roadside advice here. I think that's all we got, but I'm not sure. So just let me double check. <clears throat> Shaggy yep. Ray says it. Shaggy Ray says listen to the podcast Last road trip He's liking it a lot so. well, If Shaggy recommends it You know it's got to be good I Love Shaggy <laughs> <laughs> He's good people All right That's nothing else in the in the mailbox Or the inbox So well, we made it Rip <clears throat> We made it We did it You didn't run out of iced tea or, or voice right So you're no, good I came good. close but All right <laughs> Well, folks, until we talk to you, oh, 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 what? I almost forgot something really important. Um, starting in September, Poultry Keepers 360 Live will change days and times. 
you know, ever since we started this program, we've been every other Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Well, starting on September the 7th, we shift to every other Thursday night at 7.30 p.m. We're trying to accommodate some of the folks out on the West Coast uh, with a slight time change and, and yet not keep everybody on the east coast up late ourselves included uh, <laughs> but uh, it's just a change uh, that we felt like it was time to make and and so keep that in mind september the 7th uh, if you're listening for us on the 5th we're not going to be there but we will be there on september the 7th first thursday after labor day don't worry folks we're going to keep reminding you regularly uh, out on the groups here on the show so um but yeah, try and put it on your calendar. We want to shift to Thursday nights at seven thirty. And but hey, we appreciate y'all. And Rip, if you're done with them, we'll turn them loose. I am. Well, stick a fork in me. I'm done. All right. Thanks, Thanks folks. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. Have a good evening. <laughs>